Hello, my name is Matt Pollard. I'm the director of the International Commission of Jurists Center for the Independence of Judges and Lawyers and one of the ICJ's main representatives to the United Nations. I'll be talking about the UN Human Rights Council, including its special procedures and the universal periodic review process. The mandates of these human rights mechanisms and processes cover a wide range of issues in all countries of the world. They produce standards and guidance about how to interpret and apply human rights norms, and they also investigate and make findings about particular countries and individual cases. This presentation gives a general introduction while highlighting elements of particular relevance to preventing and responding to extrajudicial executions and enforced disappearances. The Human Rights Council is made up of 47 United Nations member states elected by the General Assembly with representation of all regions of the world. Its authority is derived from the UN Charter. When it was established in 2006, the Council replaced the former UN Commission on Human Rights, which had fulfilled similar functions since 1946. The Council meets three times a year in ordinary sessions of three or four weeks. It can also meet on an emergency basis at any time as requested by its members. The Council considers reports from the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and other UN Human Rights mechanisms. It can establish a wide range of bodies such as special rapporteurs, working groups, fact-finding missions and commissions of inquiry. It acts through the adoption of resolutions on a wide range of themes and on particular countries. All states and many other international and regional entities can participate in its sessions as observers. Only the 47 member states can vote on resolutions. Non-governmental organizations with UN ECOSOC consultative status can make written submissions and oral statements throughout most of the Council's proceedings, can engage informally in negotiations of resolutions, and can organize side events. In its thematic resolutions and in assessing the situation in particular countries, the Council invokes and applies a range of existing international standards, including treaties, non-treaty standards adopted by the Council itself, the General Assembly and the Security Council, as well as other UN bodies, and sometimes the Council acts on standards adopted by non-UN and even non-governmental entities. Resolutions of the Council can also be a source of development of new standards. Resolutions of the Council do not have direct international legal effect in the same way the treaty provisions do. However, unlike treaties, which apply only to the states that have ratified them, resolutions of the Council in principle apply to all states. Resolutions and other standards adopted or endorsed by the Council are also frequently referred to by international and some regional and national courts to assist in interpreting their own constitutional or other legal frameworks. Of particular interest to the subject matter at hand are the thematic resolutions adopted by the Council every two years on enforced disappearances and adopted every three years on extrajudicial summary or arbitrary executions. Extrajudicial executions and enforced disappearances have also been highlighted as a particular issue in numerous resolutions on specific country situations, which have also urged the governments in question to take effective action to prevent and respond to such crimes. The Council and the Commission before it has created a range of special procedures mandates, currently numbering more than 50 in total. The names of the procedures vary, but most are called special rapporteurs or working groups. They are independent experts appointed with mandates to monitor, analyze, and publish findings and recommendations on thematic issues or the human rights situation in specific countries. Each expert usually serves two three-year terms. Most special procedures mandates continue indefinitely, being renewed every three years. Each independent expert mandate reports at least once a year to the Council on their findings and recommendations, and some report also to the UN General Assembly. Special procedures carry out and report on country visits, normally at least twice per year, that result in a report with detailed findings and recommendations to the government and other stakeholders. The mandate can only visit a country at the government's invitation, 
However, mandate holders can proactively request to visit and usually publish a list of countries to which they have made such requests. Mandate holders can also travel to a country to participate in particular conferences or events without conducting a formal country visit. They can also respond to complaints about individual cases and also address concerns of a broader structural nature. The formal procedure they use to send communications to states and other actors is in the form of a letter setting out the alleged violations or abuses and requesting a detailed reply. Both the communication and any reply are then made public and the special procedure may take additional steps to draw public attention or the attention of the Council to the matter. Special procedures also conduct thematic studies and convene expert consultations. They are key contributors to the development of international human rights standards. They can carry out other forms of advocacy and publicity about concerns and best practices, including through press releases, media appearances, and other public events. They also provide advice for technical cooperation and capacity building. It's worth noting that most special procedures also make efforts to cooperate and coordinate with relevant regional human rights mechanisms, such as the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Of particular interest to the subject matter at hand, are the mandates of the Special Rapporteur on extrajudicial summary or arbitrary executions and the Working Group on Enforced or Involuntary Disappearances. Extrajudicial executions and enforced disappearances have also regularly been documented and measures to address them urged for in reports of Special Rapporteurs on particular country situations. The members of fact-finding missions and commissions of inquiry established by the Council are also independent experts, with each such body having its own staff. These bodies are usually created for renewable periods of one or two years to report to the Council on specific violations in a particular country. The Council can also create independent investigative mechanisms with a mandate to collect, analyze, and preserve evidence of crimes under international law in particular countries, with the possibility to share such evidence with international, regional, or national prosecutors or courts. The General Assembly created such a mechanism for Syria, and the Council has created one for Myanmar. A similar criminal evidence gathering mandate has also been added to some fact-finding missions and commissions of inquiry. Fact-finding missions, commissions of inquiry, and independent investigative mechanisms often don't have physical access to the territory of the state they are investigating. They have accordingly developed a wide range of techniques for acquiring credible evidence through other means. Again, extrajudicial executions and enforced disappearances frequently feature among the gross violations of human rights and crimes under international law investigated and documented by fact-finding missions, commissions of inquiry, and independent investigative mechanisms of the Council. Since 2008, the Human Rights Council has conducted a process known as the Universal Periodic Review, or UPR. Under the UPR process, the human rights situation in all UN member states is systematically discussed by the Council once every four or five years. In each cycle of the process, each state has the opportunity to report on the actions it has taken to improve its human rights situation, as well as the challenges and constraints it faces in doing so. The OHCHR also compiles and summarizes information about the country already within the UN human rights system, as well as relevant information submitted by NGOs and other stakeholders. In the discussion of the state, every other state can give feedback to that government, recognizing achievements, highlighting concerns, and ultimately posing recommendations to the state under review. Reviewed states are then expected to indicate which recommendations they support and eventually to report on measures and steps taken to implement them. This peer review mechanism for all states was adopted in an effort to address criticism that the predecessor to the Council, the Commission, focused only on certain states while ignoring others. NGOs and other stakeholders can formally provide information at the beginning of the process and informally at other stages, and can carry out informal advocacy to states encouraging them to raise certain issues or make certain recommendations. While well, the fact the recommendation has been made and accepted by the government 
does not in itself give the recommendation direct legal or normative force, it can represent an important political commitment that can be the basis for advocacy or other action at the national level. And in some cases, the UN system will make technical assistance or other resources available to assist with the implementation. In this presentation, I've described the key features and processes of the Human Rights Council, including its special procedures and the Universal Periodic Review. The different processes provide a range of opportunities for lawyers and other human rights defenders and interested persons at the national level, as well as government officials, to raise concerns about and draw attention to individual cases of enforced disappearance or extrajudicial executions or general patterns of such violations in a country or the need for legislative reform. All of the processes also produce recommendations and international standards, and in some cases, technical assistance and resources that can give additional strength to advocacy at the national level. These processes and mechanisms can also provide support to government action against extrajudicial executions and enforced disappearances at the national level, including by judges and prosecutors who can draw on their outputs as potential sources of interpretive guidance or even potentially as factual evidence of national legal frameworks and cases. Additional detail, including on the practical procedures and contact details for engaging with these UN mechanisms, can be found on the website of the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, www.ohchr.org. Examples of civil society engagement with the mechanisms can also be found on the website of the International Commission of Jurists, www.icj.org. Thank you.